guys, Mike Shoesmith here. I want to talk to you guys today about, well, first of all, I wanted to show you guys this new shirt. Somebody sent me this shirt here, which is really awesome. It says, it says Yahweh, yod hey vah hey. We did a video on this. Well, actually, Carl Gallup's our expert in these matters, did a video on this. And um, he exposed how that uh, yod hey vah hey, or Yahweh, is actually, if you uh, do some translation work on that, it actually says, or means, or symbolizes, and again, you guys will have to go to the video and check that out. Uh, and that's why we love Carl. That's why we, we um, go to him for a lot of this stuff because he is he's a master at this. But listen, uh, somebody sent me this shirt, and uh, and, it, and it says uh, Yahweh, and it says, Behold the hand, behold the nail. And underneath it says P.P. Simmons. So that was awesome. Thanks for doing that. And um, you guys, uh, uh, I don't know. I haven't uh, gotten permission from him to use his name on, on, on that yet. So I don't know. He may not want to be flooded with requests for these shirts. Um, but as soon as he tells me how to proceed with this, or if he wants to proceed at all, or if, he, if it was just a gift, a one of, uh, then thanks for that. But, and you know who you are. <laughs> but I want to talk to you guys about this story here. Uh, and it's several stories conflated into one. And the first one here is something we covered a while ago. This is uh, was a, a Yahoo News article written by uh, Virginia Heffernan. And uh, why am I a creationist? She took a lot of heat for this, and she's been denied some work. And and um, uh, she did this little intro uh, article here. And uh, and then she says that here that... Um, um, da -da 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 uh she's and also she says also at heart i'm a creationist so halfway through here she sort of misses her coming out right she's a creationist here and at heart i'm a creationist there i said it at least you dear readers won't now storm out of the restaurant like the last person i admitted that to uh in new york city saying you're a creationist is like confessing that you think Akhmedinejad has a couple of good points <laughs> maybe i'm the only creationist i know but she says, this is how I came to it. Like many people, I heard no end of Bible stories of a kid as a kid. But in the 70s in New England, they always came with the caveat that uh, they were metaphors. So I read the metaphors of Genesis and Exodus, and I was amused and bugged and uplifted and moved by them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then she goes on to uh, talk about why she became or, be well, became why she embraced the truth of the Bible when it comes to the the, um, the uh, origins narrative, you know, how we got here, etc. She says, later I read Thomas Malthus' essay on the principle of population and the origin of species by Darwin, as well as probably a dozen other books on evolution and atheism, Stephen Jay Gould and Sam Harris, etc. Uh, the Darwin, with good reason, stuck with me, though it's sometimes poetic. The origin of species has an enchantingly arid English tone to it, yada, yada, yada. We burn the book Origin of Species, on the Origin of Species every year, by the way. We just did our third one. Uh, then he says, she says, I still wasn't sure why a book that never directly touches on human evolution, much less the idea of God, was seen as having unseated the story of creation. And she's right, you know, like uh, uh, Dar Darwin did leave wide open the possibility of, of, a, of a single form, you know, like in the case of the, of, of the dog, you know, a wolf type uh, creature. Um, would give birth to all of the different various uh, species within that kind. You know, Darwin leaves that open, essentially. And uh, she says that uh, she never understood why a book that never touched on human evolution and God was seen as having unseated the story of creation. And we sort of agree with that, although Darwin's book and theory has ha really has become the engine which drives modern atheism. And then she says, cut to now. I still re read and read and listen and listen. I have never found a more compelling story of our origins than the ones that involve God. The evolutionary psychologists with their just so stories and everything um, have become more contradictory than Leviticus. So, so she's saying that, um, she, I don't know, she's sort of saying here that uh, Leviticus is contradictory. So I don't know where she's going with that. Uh, but she makes a good point here uh, near the end. Uh, she says... Um, when social science made up entirely of observations. So anyway, she's, she's, she's going to an article uh, in which uh, it depicts a, a scenario that women are, are not naturally monogamous. And yet, she says that they've always been taught by the scientists, the social scientists, the psychology scientists, that women are naturally monogamous. And then she says, 
sigh. When a social science made up of entirely of observations and hypotheses tells us first that men are polygamous and women homebodies, and then that men are monogamous and women gallivanters, and what's more builds far-fetched protocols of dating and courtship and marriage and divorce around these notions, maybe it's time to retire the whole approach. And we agree, well, I mean, we could not agree more, uh, Miss Heffernan or Mrs. Heffernan, I'm not sure if she's married or not, but uh, this brings us around to today. Uh, there are a couple of stories this week uh, which also deal with this matter. Okay, here is a, an article, right? And the headline of the article is, Baffling 400-Year-Old Clue to Human Origins. This is fascinating because scientists have found the oldest DNA evidence yet of humans' biological history but instead of neatly clarifying human evolution, the finding is adding new mysteries. And this really does lend, ev lend credence to Heffernan's position that maybe it's time to retire the whole thing and do just a mass rethink on it. And the evolutionists will say, well, you know, science is all about, uh, you know, reevaluating itself anyway. It's built into the scientific method to reevaluate itself. Okay, fine. Right now, we've basically generated a big question mark, said Matthias Meyer, a geneticist at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology uh, in Leipzig, Germany, and co-author of a new study. Hints that new hidden complexities in the human story came from the 400,000-year-old femur found in a cave in Spain. They never find the whole thing, right? You know, NPR News did a, a thing uh, recently, and uh, they let it slip in the, uh, news, um, the uh, news story that all of the fossils that you have that they have found in the world, I mean, all of them, can can easily fit in the back of a pickup truck. You know, they find bits and fragments, in this case, a femur, and they build an entire narrative around it. But anyway, they found DNA in this thing, and apparently the DNA is 400,000 years old. And many experts believe that you can actually harvest DNA as old as a million years old. So I'm not going to go to the well. DNA doesn't live 400,000 years. I'm not going to go to that. What I will do is go to this. We can scrap all of the dating methods, all of that, and start over. And, and if we, as creationists, use the Bible as the template, you know, if we go to the Bible as the template, as the, well, template's not a great word to use for that. We go to the Bible as the, as the instruction manual, then... All of this makes sense. It all makes sense. I mean, we have here we have a, we have a creation story. It's only thousands of years old, which DNA is more likely to last thousands of years than hundreds of thousands of years. The likelihood of DNA living for hundreds of thousands of years is so remote. It's very remote. Now, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I'm going to say it's very remote, right? That DNA would last 400,000 years. But we're not going to say it's impossible, uh, but uh, we're going to say that it's more likely that it's thousands of years old rather than mil it's more likely. Now, if you add on supposition upon supposition upon imagination, use your imagination. I mean, people have actually said to us, you know, creationists lack imagination. <laughs> well, if it takes imagination to come up with deep time theories, which take fish and cause them to mutate into men, if that takes in a tremendous amount of imagination, then uh, let's go with what Occam would do. You guys have heard of Occam's razor. Take the, the fewest number of assumptions, the, f the, the least amount of imagination, and just apply what you know using the science, because the word science comes from the Latin word scientia, which literally means knowledge. So we know that Men produce men, bacteria produce bacteria. You know, that's another thing is bacteria that has become the, the go-to example for evolution now is bacteria developing the ability to digest a new food source. But really all you have is bacteria becoming bacteria and staying within their, their, their genetic kind, which is exactly what the Bible says will happen. So if we go to the Bible on this stuff and we say, okay, what does the Bible say? What does the science say? Okay, the science fits the Bible. But as soon as you start adding uh, uh, all these uh, theories, you know that fish became men, which is what evolution teaches, that fish became men over millions upon millions of years, 
it requires a great deal of imagination. And, you know, we don't need to imagine what happened. And people tell us, well, creationists lack imagination. No, we just lack the evidence to show that, uh, that fish have become anything other than fish. We don't have that evidence. We don't have any evidence that horses have, have ever left the equine kind, the equine genus, that, that cats have ever been anything other than cats. You know, we have varying species. We have speciation within a kind, but it never leaves the barriers. We have the gametic barriers, which isolate the kind to itself. Sure, a, a kind of, of, uh, a kind of uh, organism may develop the ability to digest a certain kind of food that it couldn't do before. Uh, that may require the, the lessening of its uh, genetic, uh, you know, like a, a breakdown of the genetics to form a different looking creature, but it's still, a, it's still that same kind of creature. It's within that, that gametic barrier. I mean, we don't need to imagine anything. All we do is we look at the evidence, we look at what we see around us, we look at the Bible. The Bible says that everything was created after its own kind, and that's what we see happening in, in the evidence. And that's what we go, okay, that must be what's happening, right? Here's our Facebook page. And uh, I posted this to our Facebook page. Um, and, it, and surprisingly, I mean, this didn't get a lot of attention on our Facebook page, uh, which did sort of surprise me because here's an article in the, from Live Science. And uh, Live Science is saying here, uh, the headline is how men's brains are wired differently than women's. And this article... Uh, they may have to go in and revise this because uh, what they've done is they posted an article here, a scientific article about the differences between men and women, and there's no hint at evolution here at all. So they may have to go in and revise this for the evolution uh, believers, the Evo heads, we call them. And essentially, it's saying this article written by Live Science, which is a scientific article written by Tanya Lewis, and essentially what she says here is that men and women are wired differently. And there's all kinds of intelligent design language in here. <laughs> this, this, this is a creationist article on life science. And basically, if you go down here, uh, uh, that uh, it's fascinating that we can see some of the functional differences in men and women structurally. You know, structurally, the word structurally, it, it uh, lends itself to the creationist language. It just does. And much of this article talks about wiring and structure and, and evidence that men and women are, are created differently. <laughs> well, guess what? All we do is we look at this evidence, when we look at what the Bible says, and we go, yep, men and women were created differently because they're separate created beings created by Almighty God. I mean... Uh, you know, the more we look at this evidence, the more we look at the evidence for evolution, we see it unraveling, we see it coming apart. The more we look at the evidence for creationism and intelligent design, we see it all uh, confirming and conflating into a, a common understanding that uh, when it comes to the, to the Bible's narrative for, for how we got here, it is totally trustworthy. And there's no question that uh, the evolutionists need to do a mass rethink on... What they on uh, what they're going to use as a reason to jettison God from the conversation, you know, and jettison God from schools, and get rid of get rid of the um, the accountability factor here. Because at the end of the day, if uh, if we were created by a loving uh, Creator, uh, we're at the end of the day we're all accountable to this to this uh, entity, this personality. So this is another reason why. Why the atheists are wrong and, and uh, atheism makes no sense. They need this, though. They need this to cling to in order to justify their delusion, the mental disorder. Atheism is a mental disorder, and it's a logical fallacy. It's the, it's the converse fallacy of accident, which says, you know, because I've never seen evidence for God, no God could possibly exist. And so they come up with all of these imaginary tales of deep-time fish-to-man evolution, when, in fact... Uh, the evidence is all around them. I mean, I'm evidence. If I come to you and I say, look, I, had a, I have a personal relationship with God. This is what he did for me uh, yesterday, last week. That's called anecdotal evidence. And I am a personal witness for Jesus Christ that God has done something for me. Now, there are people who access the spirit world, and they have anecdotal evidence that, that atheism is wrong based on the existence of the supernatural realm. So, so if we add... My personal, my personal testimony of a relationship with, with a transcendent being, 
God is transcendental. It's, these are this is a trans, this is not transcendental evidence for God. This is transcendental evidence against atheism, right? It's T A A. I call it transcendental or T E A. Transcendental evidence against atheism. So that'd be T E A A, right? It's not T A G. Transcendental evidence for God. We have mountains upon mountains of transcendental evidence against atheism because we have millions, billions of people who have experienced the supernatural. And all we're asking atheists to do is to drop the whole, the whole uh, delusion bubble, to break free from that, and to embrace the fact that, that the anecdotal, anecdotal evidence alone is sufficient reason to say, look, atheism cannot be true. It can't be true that the, that the supernatural doesn't exist just based on the anecdotal evidence alone. And then we say, okay, now that you've broken free from that, from that delusion bubble, that you've put yourself in, that you've encased yourself in to hide yourself from, from the enormous reality that surrounds us uh, in the supernatural arena. And then we can, uh, we can go in and say, look, now that you've done that, let me tell you about uh, the, the uh, truth that I have discovered and that God has revealed to me about the supernatural, about the transcendental realm, and about God Almighty himself, that he has revealed himself to us through his son, Jesus Christ, that he has paid the price, he's removed all guilt so that he can adopt us into his family and be adopted out of this family that is wretched and, and, and involved in not only societal decay, but, but uh, uh, biological decay. You know, if, if, uh, if uh, evolution is not true, as we have seen, then devolution is definitely true. We have a biological breakdown on all on all fronts here. There's a war going on against our bodies, and and uh, the we're losing that battle. We're losing it. Science is able to keep us alive because God has given in the minds of men this ability to be creative and to create uh, ways to keep people alive using science. God has given us science. Without God, there is no science. Um, God has given us that ability, but without that, we lose that battle, folks. We're in a process of biological decay. We're, we're circling the drain here, really, and uh, which is more evidence that uh, the creator of the universe will someday, hopefully soon, redeem us from this uh, situation that we found ourselves in, thanks to our biological father, Adam. Uh, and, uh, and hence, that's why we get back to uh, everyone who was created as a template. And Adam and Eve are our template. They are our mother and father, uh, biologically speaking. So there we go. My name is Mike Shoesmith. You've been watching P.P. Simmons Television. I'm on the P.P. Simmons can today. Thanks for watching.